Hello everyone! So I've mentioned in the past that Splatoon is one of, if not my favourite multiplayer game of all time. And while I will always have fun playing game modes like Tower Control or Rainmaker for example, in my opinion easily the best mode that both Splatoons 2 and 3 have to offer would be Grisco, one of the most high octane and fun PvE modes that Overwatch 2 only dreams it could have. And with Splatoon 3's first major DLC update on the way, I began to think, what if Grisco were to receive a real major update too? It's been completely shafted in the seasonal updates so far, only being given one brand new map, a few returning ones, and a single new weapon. So today I thought I'd cover all the major aspects of how Grisco works, including its weapons, bosses, and custom modes, and design new features for each of these for a potential future update. So without question, one of the best parts of playing Grisco, if we ignore the ever-looming stress of being flattened like a fucking pancake every 20 seconds, is the fact that there are completely unique weapons that can appear in rotations. However, while the Grisco weapons might be really fun to use, not every class is created equally. There are a few classes in the game that still don't have Grisco weapons, so let's change that. I'll be covering all of the remaining weapon classes that have yet to be blessed with an illegally modified Grisco variant, and covering what kind of special properties I think each one should have. But before we do that, I want to cover the currently available Grisco weapons, because there's a few that I think could really use some small tweaks. And yeah, okay, there's just a few I want to make fun of. So starting with the Grisco Blaster, this was one of the first ones added all the way back in Splatoon 2, and weirdly enough, I don't have a problem with this one. It's basically just the normal blaster with the speed of a Clash Blaster, and yeah, I think for one of the first Grisco weapons implemented, this is a really interesting idea. The only change I was possibly thinking to make to this thing would be to have a larger but more delayed explosion. If we slow the rate of fire and projectile speed down a bit, this could become a really good defensive option, being as the projectiles would stick around longer, have a larger explosion radius, and just do more damage in general. But for what it is, it's pretty good. Next is the Grizz Cobrella, and this is one of the ones that I have a bit of an issue with. The idea behind the Grizz Cobrella is that its entire thing is being unable to actually deploy the Brella, which defeats the entire purpose of the weapon. Yes, it has a fast fire rate and everything, but this is basically just a weaker Grizz Co Blaster at this point. So I wanted to change this one to give it some interesting properties. And I was thinking, what if this Brella was like the Undercover Brella, where you can fire while still being behind the shield? However, I want the Grisco Brella to have the Tent Brella as its shield instead, not the weak-ass piece of paper the Undercover Brella has. The other property I wanted to give to this thing would be a full-on Gravity Divine Brella. When the shield eventually pops off and flies ahead of you, unlike all the other weapon types of this class, it won't be affected by gravity, meaning it could very easily hit bosses like the Steelhead or the Fish Sticks from long distances. I also find it weird that we haven't had a Brella like this added to the game, even just a normal one for the other game modes. It would be such an interesting addition to what is otherwise the most boring class in the game. Next is the Grisco Charger, and this is another weapon that I really think is a massive missed opportunity, because this is just a slightly better bamboozler. And yes, I understand not every one of these things can be an unstoppable nightmare of a machine mangled together by forcing parts of different weapons to make some unholy entity, but they should at the very least try to be that. I've always hated this one because to me at least, it's the worst of the Grisco weapons. So now instead of it being an instant charging bamboozler, it's an instant charging elita. Much like the real Grisco charger, it wouldn't be able to hold its charge when you swim through ink but it has the charge time of a bamboozler, the range of an elita, as well as the same mechanic as the snipe writer. This monstrous hellspawn of a sniper will now be able to hold a whopping 8 charges at once, making this the single best backline support in existence. If someone who's actually good with a sniper gets their hands on this thing, you've pretty much already won. I always found it kind of stupid that this weapon that's entire thing is backlining has a feature in Grisco that makes it awful for doing that exact thing. Grisco Slosher. Full marks. Literally have nothing to complain about this thing. It is amazing and it feels so damn fun to play. Also, it's known amongst my friend group as the Flyfish Killer, so it is by default the best one. Grisco Stringer. I couldn't get footage of this one because Grisco fucking hates me. I've always had a bit of a weird relationship with this thing. On the one hand, Stringers to me are just more annoying to use chargers. I never really got the feel for them to be honest. But the Grisco Stringer always felt like a blast to use. The 9 shots it can fire really make this thing an interesting weapon whenever it lands in the rotation, though I do wish it had a bit more power than it currently does. 
So my idea is to take what the Grisco Stringer already does and add two very small but significant changes to it. For one, at full charge, the bullets, instead of just going in a random direction, will auto-lock onto targets. That way, this thing can be great for widespread close-range defending, but also good for dealing with pesky enemies that are being protected by walls of Salmonids. The range on the homing shots wouldn't be immensely wide, but it would be enough to the point that you'd pretty much always want whoever's using this thing to have a full charge ready and waiting for the next boss to show up. The second thing is that any of those full charge shots that happen to miss an enemy or simply don't lock on will now also be given the same secondary effect that the torpedoes have, creating a really small cluster of mini explosions around the impact site, potentially dealing that extra bit of damage to enemies nearby, or just using the delayed explosions from said cluster bombs as a way to revive a teammate from a poorly timed shot. I always like the idea of these more experimental weapons, as the game calls them, to have features that you wouldn't see in normal weapons, and I think these two additions are a perfect example of that. Much like the Schlosher, I have no real problems with the Grizzco Splatana. It's pretty much everything I wanted it to be. As for the Grizzco Duelies, however, well, okay, here's the thing. Ignoring the fact that this is another example of the game hating me because even after multiple hours of trying, I couldn't get this thing in the rotation for the life of me. I wrote down my ideas for the remaining weapons back in January, back before the actual Grisco Dooleys were released. And I've been putting off this video for a long ass time. So now to finally get around to making this video and to see how close my ideas were to the actual Grisco Dooleys is kind of scary to be honest. The only differences between my idea for the Grisco Dooleys and the real one was that I thought it'd have a fire rate much more similar to the Gluga Dooleys, being a much slower but much more powerful weapon, with six rolls instead of nine. Another difference was that the dodge rolls in my design would have the explosion radius and rate of fire for the weapon increase exponentially with each consecutive roll. But honestly, I think what they actually ended up doing is still a really good idea. It's definitely interesting to see how close I got with my prediction, especially being as I was convinced we were never even getting any more Grisco weapons in the first place. But hey, you don't see me complaining. Before we get to covering the remaining weapon classes, this has to be said as soon as possible. Grisco private lobbies need a serious revamp. Not being able to set the weapons or specific events made this the single most frustrating video to record since I rebranded my channel. The settings for private Grisco lobbies are so restrictive. You cannot choose weapons, nor can you select what kind of events will pop up even if you wanted to. I mean, for crying out loud, the game literally refers to this as a practice mode. Come on! This would be the equivalent of you going into training mode in Smash Bros and then not having access to features like game speed or items or anything like that. It's ridiculous. The next update needs to revamp this because not being able to use whatever weapon you want in whatever scenario you want in a practice mode with friends is the single most ridiculous restriction I could possibly think of. So now let's cover the four remaining weapon classes and give them some kind of horrific Grisco-ified update. Starting with the generic shooters, it's weird that we haven't actually gotten one of these yet, but I've always held out hope that one day we get some kind of upgrade in the form of a Grisco weapon, and I am here to provide. So for starters, this is going to be the only Grisco weapon which changes its state depending on how long you hold the fire button. This grisco matic as I'm calling it, is a supercharged sploosh matic when you hold down the fire button, initially it will seem identical to the weapon it's mimicking. But after a second or so of you holding down the button, the weapon begins firing with much greater range and damage, eventually being able to reach the ranges of the NZAP-89. The weapon would still fire just as fast as in the original state, but at max range would fire in a huge arc that would have the largest spread of any weapon in the game. And to be clear here, I'm not talking about the normal spread the sploosh matic has, I'm talking Cuphead spread shot levels of crazy. And while you're refilling ink, it would slowly return to its original state, meaning that letting go of the button for a few seconds won't completely reset the weapon's range. I think out of all of the available classes, the generic shooters would probably be the last ones to get a Grisco weapon, especially with how much love they're getting in the seasonal updates. But I think something like this could be a really interesting mechanic for the most basic class in the game. And now onto my personal favorite class, Rollers. And for this, I thought it'd be fun to return these menacing beasts to their original Splatoon 1 states. Sort of. So for this roller, it's going to be very similar to the Stamper, in that both its vertical and horizontal flicks will have no range whatsoever. But as a compromise to this, not only will this roller have the run speed of a carbon roller, being able to absolutely blitz around the Salmonid stages without a care in the world, but it will also have the crushing power of a dynamo roller, being able to crush anything in its path. 
This thing also to compensate for its dog shit flinging power would also be able to deal piercing damage to any enemy it comes across. Meaning something like a scrapper or a steel head would get absolutely flattened by this thing. It would be borderline useless against any airborne enemies, don't get me wrong, but anything that lands on the ground would just be demolished by the sheer power of this beast of a roller. Not many players that I know of who use rollers actually use, you know, the rolling part of the damn thing. So I thought it'd be a fun idea to make a roller that's entire purpose is to roll over everything. As for the brushes, we don't really have a lot to go off of because there's what, four brushes in the game currently? Maybe five? So it's time to get creative again. This Grisco brush will be a pretty slow weapon when it comes to attacking. It will have a decent spread though, similar to the newly added Pain Brush, which, sidebar, is the single best named weapon in the entire game. It'll also have a slow running speed, but unlike other brushes, it will deal 100 damage on contact, being able to run right over the generic Salmonids and Small Fry. And as an extra bit of a kick, we're giving it its own special property. If you're standing still and holding down the fire button, you'll be able to charge up a spin attack, which will send a small wave of ink in all directions, instantly killing any generic enemies that are close to you, and still dealing a decent chunk of damage to any enemy that is just outside the initial hit. It's always fun in my opinion taking some kind of unique aspect about a weapon and tweaking it slightly so that it plays almost entirely differently. Sacrificing the mobility of a normal brush for the power of what is essentially a full-on axe swing would be a really interesting change-up to how this weapon is played. Now, finally, for far and away my least favourite weapon class, Splatlings. They don't get a Grisco weapon because they don't deserve one. Okay, okay, I'm only joking. For the Grisco Splatling, this thing is taking literally everything I hate about fighting annoying players online and bundling it all into one absolute behemoth of a backline offensive weapon. The Grisco Splatling would seem, at first, to function like a normal Hydra Splatling, with its immense range, slow movement speed, and a weird and very unnatural ability to call forth the absolute worst in every single Splatoon player. And everything will seem pretty normal until you begin to charge it. That's when you realise this thing would have the charge time of a ballpoint Splatling, along with its natural property of its range doubling when you charge it to max. However, the Grisco Splatling would also have the single worst fire rate of any Splatling in the game. Instead of firing tons of tiny bullets at once, we're turning this thing into a mix of a Gatling gun and a shotgun. Now this thing will fire slow but huge bursts of ink, similarly to how the Grisco Slosher does in semi-rapid succession. A full charge would get you around 10 to 15 shots, each doing around 120 damage each. And to make up for the Splatling's complete lack of ability to defend itself at close range, each one of those shots would be shot out with a typical shotgun blast, completely obliterating any enemy that dares to get close enough to try and hit you. I'm gonna be honest, I know blasters are kind of the shotgun equivalent in Splatoon, but I really wanted something that was similar to a much more traditional shotgun. And turning the Hydra Splatling into a hybrid of a double barrel shotgun and an obscenely long range Gatling gun sounds like the single funniest possible idea I could do to this thing. So, I did. And now that the Grisco employees are fully kitted out with all of these new abominations we call weapons, let's turn our heads to the bottom of the ocean. Because what would a Grisco update be without brand new bosses? For starters, being as it's shown by the devs that the location of Splatoon 3 isn't really that far away from where Splatoons 1 and 2 took place, what exactly is stopping the Salmonids from harvesting some of the special weapons that were left behind when the Inklings and Octolings migrated to Splatsville? I mean, for God's sake, they already stole the Stingray, Inkstorm, Wavebreaker, and yeah, technically Booyah Bomb too. Who's to say they wouldn't steal more? The first boss I came up with was designed after the Baller special from Splatoon 2. Having a Salmonid surface from a completely metallic ball and just be this fast, annoying threat that could roll over players. Once you deal enough damage to it, it would begin flashing much like the special from the second game, and eventually it would explode in your coloured ink, dropping the three golden eggs that were hidden inside. These enemies probably wouldn't be too tough to deal with on their own, as much like the real baller special, attacking it would be able to slow down this giant moving explosion. Plus it would give you ample time to get out of the way before it actually explodes. I could see this thing being one of the less imposing bosses on earlier difficulties, but having a small, fast-moving enemy mowing down players when you're focused on much larger threats like the Steelhead or God forbid a King Salmonid could become an absolute nightmare in seconds. If you wanted something slightly different for this thing though, they could just use the A-Balls from the Octo Expansion. Realistically, either would work perfectly fine, but personally I like the idea of them just using the Baller Special more. The second special I was thinking the bosses could steal would be the Splashdown. And this would work sort of similarly to the Big Shot. 
Having this huge salmonid boss that would pick up smaller hordes of salmonids, small fry, and quahog, and then crumple them up into a ball before throwing them into the air. As the ball of enemies lands, it would create a splashdown effect that would toss these enemies out into the field, much closer to where a player is currently standing. Unlike the big shot boss though, this boss would have to be surrounded by smaller enemies in order for them to be able to attack. But I think that's much more balanced, being as not only will they almost always be surrounded by enemies anyway, but it also gives them some kind of exploitable weakness being as their actual attack would be so threatening. Now, yes, technically Kohosuna does use this as one of its primary methods of attacking. But honestly, the King Salmonids are so rare and the Splashdown isn't even its main way of attacking that I personally think it's fine if a normal boss uses the Splashdown too. And the final special I think they could steal from would be the Bubbler. This boss would be a flying enemy that constantly spews bubbles in random directions. Each of these bubbles would function basically exactly the same as they did in Splatoon 2, with you having to shoot them constantly in order to deflate them, while the other Salmonids and bosses could hit them a few times to make them explode. The actual way to harm the flying boss, however, would be either with a sniper or having some form of weapon with decent range so you can deal with it when it's on its short cooldown. It really is kind of a shame that some of the more fun and interesting specials simply got left behind in Splatoon 2, rather than being upgraded or changed like the killer whale was going from 1 to 3. So if the Inklings and Octolings aren't going to use them, why not let the Salmonids use them instead? The last thing I want to cover are new events and even entirely new game modes that could come from a Salmon Run update. We only got two new special events when the game mode was revealed in Splatoon 3, being the Tornado and the Mudmouths, which yeah, are interesting sure, but only getting two new modes doesn't really feel like anything worthwhile. So let's add two more. The first one I was thinking of is an actual full-on tower defense mode, kind of like the nighttime expeditions in Pikmin 4 for example. You'd start with the egg basket protected by some kind of multi-layered shield and you'd have to spend the entire round defending it. In this special event, Salmonids and bosses wouldn't focus on any player that's not actively inches away from their face or just straight up attacking them, and instead would only directly target the egg basket. Now, to balance this out being as this could be an instant loss on, say, Executive VP during High Tide, the shield that's protecting the egg basket would not only have a ridiculous amount of health, but also three separate shields defending it, and the health that it has would depend on the overall level of the group that's currently playing. If the last one gets broken though, the round is over. To be honest, this is what I initially thought Salmon Run would be, defending some kind of safe zone against hordes of Salmonids. Now, don't get me wrong, what we got is way more fun, but I still think this idea could absolutely work for a unique round instead of the whole game mode. The events themselves are never really that unique with the exception of, say, Rush or Mothership, but at the same time, I honestly massively prefer the ones like that that end up changing how you play for a round. The second one is a little different though, it would be one of the more simple changes, and that's fluctuating tides. This game mode would be exactly what it says on the tin. The tide would start at a set point, and then as the match goes on, it would change to another level. And then again, and then again, over and over until the round ends. Think basically like how Mahi Mahi Resort works, only constantly throughout the round as opposed to once per game. There's not really much to explain here though, being as this is just a simple change like the Fog or Goldie events. The final thing I'm going to be talking about in this video is two entirely new modes that would be added to Salmon Run, one of which I'm pretty sure is already confirmed to be included either in the next seasonal update or two, or it's being added when the side order drops, and that is an endless mode. To be honest, why hasn't this been added already? It's the most obvious feature that would be so ridiculously simple to add. All you'd have to do is either remove the time limit and waves entirely and let players just keep going for as long as they want, refilling their special weapons every, say, minute or so, and then just let them go at it and play for as long as they want to. Or alternatively, and this is the much more likely option if they ever do add this mode in, you could keep the timer and wave mechanics and then just let people see how many waves they can survive. Throw in some random events like Fog, Rush, Fluctuating Tide, Mothership, any of those for fun and then refill specials every two rounds and you've got yourself a game mode that I genuinely don't think I'd ever stop playing. This could even be a perfect opportunity to turn this into a competition and have online leaderboards for whoever can survive the longest waves on certain difficulties. I genuinely think this would breathe some new life into the game as it would give players a reason to go back to Salmon Run outside of the desire to get new gear. And finally, why don't we have a PvP version of Salmon Run yet? This might be really awkward to implement, but think about it. Having the maps flipped back to back so each team essentially has their own map to work with, then fighting the other team for control over the bosses and the golden eggs. I think you'd probably have to make it so that the two teams couldn't kill each other or something like that because then would lead to some serious spawn camping. 
but they'd still be fighting for all the available eggs that the bosses drop across three rounds. Something like this would need to be properly balanced though, especially being as it requires eight people instead of just four. But it would be a hell of a lot of fun to grab three of my friends and just go crazy against a team of four random people while playing Salmon Run at the same time. It would essentially be just another game mode like Rainmaker or Splat Zones that you could access at any time, though I don't really think it would be available during big runs for example, pretty much solely because of how big runs are executed, kind of like how the rank modes are banned during Splatfests. Either way, a game mode like this would be amazing, mostly because it means I'd have some form of fun PvP to do whenever Clan Blitz comes into the rotation on series ranked mode. Obviously, what I, and I'm pretty sure most Splatoon players, actually want is a true Salmon Run themed story mode with its own unique bosses that don't show up in Salmon Run. Something like the Octo expansion that would have you completing incredibly tough challenges with tons of variety. But I really don't think this mode will ever be anything more than just a fun side package that's arguably more enjoyable than the main game at times. But even still, what do you think? With all that said, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like on it. While you're down there, be sure to leave a comment saying what kind of updates you'd like to see for Salmon Run in the future. Also, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, join the Discord server, all that good stuff, and until next time, stay safe everyone. Peace.